and amen. We're in the book of 2 Peter. We thank uh, our brother for reading the text this morning, Brother Woods, 2 Peter. And I want to uh, do an overview of 2 Peter. And I'm going to give you my subject before we even get started. Dangers to the church from within. Dangers to the church from within. The church has always been and will always be plagued by false teachers, false apostles, false prophets, false preachers and false Christians, those who name the name of Christ and say they represent God, but in fact, they represent Satan. They create confusion in the church. They create disorder in the church. And they keep the church in a battle situation all the time. Jesus himself predicted, writing in Matthew chapter 24, that there will come false Christians, false prophets, and even false Christs. John warned of many antichrists who were already at work in the church in his epistle. Jude warned about evil, wicked, lascivious men who would come and cause us to have to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And the beloved Apostle Paul fought false teachers everywhere he went. <clears throat> Excuse me. And no sooner would he found a church than false teachers would invade it. And Peter predicted false prophets and false teachers who would lead people astray and be very successful at it. And as we begin our study of 2 Peter, it is a short book, only three chapters. I first want to talk, walk you, I want to walk you through the letter. And uh, so you'll be familiar with the contents and the overall emphasis and flow that characterizes the letter. And as I give an overview of 2 Peter, then compare it with uh, a couple of other uh, passages of scripture, I trust that it will give us some kind of broad perspective on the letter. I was thinking again as I worked through the letter about how people in Peter's day got their information. You see, if we were living back in those days and were members of one of the churches in Asia Minor where the letter was probably sent, we uh, li uh, li would likely would have gathered in a, a much smaller meeting place than this perhaps in someone's home. We would have been told that we had received a letter this week from Peter and someone would have read the letter to those who were assembled. Keep in mind that in those days, people didn't have uh, the convenience 
uh, that we, of our writing material that we have today. They couldn't go after service and get a copy of the uh, tape or the CD. They couldn't run off some copies of the letter from a, from a copy machine. But I want you to understand that the people had to sit as you're sitting. The people had to listen and they had to concentrate while the letter was being read. Then after it had uh, been read and they had gone home, then they had to remember what was said so that they can be encouraged by it. Amen? And perhaps they came back at another time and heard the letter read again. So how blessed are we to have a copy in our own hands of the word of God so that we can read it and reread it. We can go back to the first letter that Peter wrote and compare it with the second letter. Amen. And then I thought, if God held them accountable and responsible, and he did, for knowing and living the truth that they heard and that they were taught, how much more accountable and responsible are we who have been blessed to have our own copy of God's truth? As we study the second letter of Peter, we are to note that certain things are left out of the second letter or that are found in the first letter. And at the heart of second Peter is the issue of false doctrine and false teachers. You see, in Peter's second letter, he is presupposing the first letter. For instance, if you were to write someone a letter, then followed up with a second letter, you wouldn't sit down and rewrite the entire first letter that you wrote. Am I right about it? But you might build on the first letter. Amen? You might refer to the first letter, then presuppose it. Amen. So don't be discouraged. If you hear some folks saying that Second Peter is not a doctrinal, well, perhaps it isn't. But when you put both of them together, amen, both of them balance out one another. First Peter Listen carefully. First Peter emphasizes the external dangers to the church from without, from without. But second Peter emphasizes the internal dangers to the church from within. And the dangers from within are more serious and more hazardous than the dangers are from without. Amen? Amen. You see, the theme of First Peter is suffering. We spent a lot of time looking at uh, through the uh, details of First Peter, and I want to note that the theme of First Peter, keep in mind, is suffering. Let's hear that. Let's repeat that. Suffering. So Peter wrote to the Jewish believers in Asia Minor, encouraging them to continue to live holy and godly lives in face of the suffering, the trials and the persecution and the opposition that they were facing. When you look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 6, he tells us that they are 
uh, to greatly rejoice, though for uh, a season, if it need, in that and what God has promised them in salvation. What did he say, preacher? Well, let's go to First Peter chapter one. Look at verse number seven. He says in verse seven that they are being tested by what? Fire. See, these trials, these testings is coming from the outside. They're external. People are slandering them, falsely accusing them and attacking them because of their identification with Christ. Reading from the New uh, American Standard Bible, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> Beginning on verse number 19 and 20. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 through 20. It says, For whenever anyone bears the pain of unjust suffering because of consciousness of God, that is a grace. But what credit is there if you are patient when beaten for doing wrong? But if you are patient when you are suffering for doing what is good, this is grace before God. Look at chapter 3, verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Do you hear that, church? If you're suffering for righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear them uh, uh, who intimidate you. Do not be troubled. See, we are not to get upset when we are persecuted, when we, when we are slandered or maliciously attacked when we're living for our God and honoring our Savior. You ought to be ready to give an answer regarding your faith in Jesus Christ. Look at uh, verse number 16. According to verse 16, you ought to keep your conscience, what, clear. So that when you are maligned, those who defame your good conduct in Christ may themselves be what? Put to shame. Verse 17 says, for it is better to suffer for doing good if that be the will of God than for doing evil. Let's jump down to verse number 18. See, when we look for as suffering, our greatest example is Jesus. Jesus is our example for Christ also suffered for us. We also see that in uh, chapter 4, verses 12 to 13. He says, beloved, do not be surprised that a trial by fire is, is occurring among you as if something strange were happening to you. He says, but rejoice that the ex to the extent that you, you share in your suffering of Christ so that when his glory is revealed, you may also Rejoice exultingly. Oh, see, don't, wor don't worry about what people are doing to you. See, they are really, uh, we find that they are really suffering because of their identification with Jesus. Anytime you identify with Jesus, you're going to suffer. We see that in uh, uh, chapter 5, verse number 8. We understand the Bible says that 
The devil is behind all the suffering and all the mistreatment. The Bible says be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, he's, he's prowling around like a roaring lion looking uh, for someone to devour. But the Bible says resist him. Church, when folks start talking that talk in your ear, well, you know about sister so-and-so. Resist them. Did you hear about brother so-and-so? Resist them. Amen. Be steadfast in faith, knowing that your fellow believers throughout the world undergo the same suffering. Because this is nothing new. Here, Peter indicates that Satan is the driving spiritual force behind suffering. So when you are slandered or falsely accused at your job, there's no uh, good humor explanation for it. Perhaps you are doing better than anyone else at the job, but you are, were slandered and falsely accused. Satan was attacking you because you belong to the living God. So the emphasis in 1 Peter is suffering. Attacks are coming from the outside the church. Amen. Unbelievers are attacking believers and attacking the church. But the emphasis of Second Peter is different. The focus is on attacks, satanic work that comes from within the professing church. As we see in Second Peter 2 verses 1 to 3 of our text. The Bible says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. And many will follow their sensuality and because of them, the ways of truth will be maligned and in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Here we have the attack in the church and it's coming from within. They are internal. Believers are in danger from those who profess to belong to Christ, who profess to be teaching the truth. But they're really the emissaries of the devil. They are working from within to undermine the work of God, to lead believers astray and to destroy the testimony of the church. You see, this is far greater danger than attacks are from outside. So, you, so, so perhaps you're saying, uh, well, what does this, this have to do with me? What does this have to do with me? Well, I wanna, I wanna look at the last words of a dying apostle. Even though it is often neglected. Second Peter is of particular significance because it contains the last words of the apostle Peter. Just as second Timothy is considered of particular significance because it is the letter Paul wrote shortly before his martyrdom. Well, Second Peter is the letter that Peter wrote 
shortly before he was martyred. Look at uh, chapter 1, verse 14. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Knowing that the laying aside of my earthly, Peter is talking, my earthly dwelling is imminent. As also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. See, he expects at any time to be martyred. So here we have Peter's burden placed on his heart by the Holy Spirit of God. And as he faced imminent death, you know, there's something about a person that's just about to die. They got something to say. Am I right about it? Remember, in 1 Peter, the key was what? Suffering. But in 2 Peter, the key word is know or knowledge. Know or knowledge. You see, the word know or knowledge are used some 16 times in uh, these three chapters. They are the theme, the key theme words to know or the true knowledge of God. In 2 Peter chapter 1, it's the true knowledge of God and the maturing of God's people. In chapter 2, it's the true knowledge of God and the dangers to God's people because of false teachers. Chapter three, it's the true knowledge of God and the coming judgment. See, we need to understand the impact of that judgment on false teachers and what its impact should be on the people of God. Am I right about it? You see, Underlining, it's, it's all a matter of knowing God and his truth and being shaped by it. I think I said something. It's a matter of knowing God and his truth and being shaped by it. See, chapter 1 lays the foundation for chapter 2. Two. Chapter 2 is the pivotal chapter. And chapter 3 gives the consequences or the ultimate end of what is discussed in chapter 2. The book of uh, Second Peter is, is of such a pertinent letter. It's about the true knowledge of God in dealing with false doctrine and false teachings from within the church. Let's look at some of the highlights of this letter. The opening two verses gives us an introduction or greeting. And then we come into the letter as Peter talks about the true knowledge of God and the maturing of God's people. Note the emphasis on knowledge in the opening verses. We're looking at 2 Peter chapter 1 and 2. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 2, excuse me. He talks about, he says, grace and peace be what? multiplied to who to you in what in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ church if you want grace if you want peace you can get it multiplied if you know God and Jesus Christ our Lord. You see verse number three. According as his divine power. 
has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through what? Through true knowledge of him who called us. Are oh, you getting this picture? You see, life and godliness comes through knowing God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. At the end of verse number five, we are told to add knowledge to moral excellence and in knowledge, self-control. But when you jump down to verse number eight, if you jump down to verse number eight, and this, I love this verse. He says, for if these qualities are yours, and here's the key, and are increasing. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, this is the key. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, listen, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. If these qualities of yours are not increasing, If they are not increasing, then you are useless. God can't use you. You're not growing. You're not fruitful. But he says, if they are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in what? The true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know Jesus. Amen. Amen. Study. Study to show thyself approved on the God of work but not be ashamed but rightly dividing the word of truth. If you want to know Jesus. You have to increase in your knowledge of who they are. Who God is and who Jesus is. Note that they repeat the emphasis is on knowing and knowledge, knowing and knowledge, knowing and knowledge. I understand that the foundation and the heart and center of what God is doing is the knowledge of himself. God wants you to know who he is. They talk about, oh, I got a personal relationship with God. Do you know who he is? Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? And we come into this knowledge through faith in his son. I said we come into this knowledge through faith in his son. Look at verse number three. Look at verse number three and four. God has called us to be partakers of a divine nature. You see, when that happens, we are born again. We become children of God through faith in the death and resurrection of Christ. We enter into the knowledge of God himself. Now, this knowledge is not just a... Uh, some facts. You're aware that Paul wrote in uh, Corinthians and said, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. <laughs> Seeking knowledge by trying to collect more information than someone else is not what Paul, uh, not what Peter is concerned about. Rather, he's concerned about true knowledge of the living God. 
transforming our lives and the results in, in, in increasing growth and development of God's people. So, beginning with verse 5, he talks about growth and development, about producing fruit about showing the character of God in our lives. He talks about diligently building upon the foundation of our faith. In verse 5, he says, For now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence, in your faith. So the faith is the foundational and was talked about in verse number one. Which brings me to another point. We are told to build upon faith with seven virtues. With faith as our foundation, Peter says we are to build upon it. To faith, we are to add seven virtues or qualities that are mentioned in verses 5 or through 7. They are moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and most of all, love. He says, if these qualities or virtues are yours and do what? Increase or abound. You see, they have to increase. They guarantee fruitlessness in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, we're not talking about a static knowledge. We're not talking about a knowledge that is just a collection of facts. But we're talking about knowledge that is, is, is taken into your life and shapes all that you are and all that you do. We sometimes play it off. Well, if I had a choice, I'd rather have love than knowledge. But I came all the way from Georgia, stop by here to tell you, you don't have a choice. You will never have a true biblical love without the true knowledge of God. You need the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, the truth concerning him and his person. If there's any to be any change in your life, amen? As Peter talks about the knowledge of Jesus, the knowledge of God, and he is preparing us for before his departure, from earth. It is of utmost importance that his readers understand that true knowledge is anchored in the scriptures. Amen. You enter into true knowledge of God by having a true understanding of God's revelation of himself in the scriptures. Peter tells them that he's not giving them new information. See, he, he, here is a man who has received direct information from Jesus Christ, direct revelation from God. And now he had, he's at the end of his life and it says, I want to remind you 
of some old stuff. In verse 12, he says, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. So no, I come back this to this verse just to let you know that I have nothing new to tell you. I mean, you've heard this many times. Uh, some, 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 so, so I come back to Peter and say, praise the Lord. You have been established no, in truth. Uh, those, those sermons that you heard preached Sunday after Sunday gospel meetings and youth conferences you have been established and now I just want to remind you about it again it's a reminder to all of us not to grow tired of the old truth It's a characteristic of false teachers and unbelievers that they always want in pursuit of something new. But we, as believers, ought to find our joy in that same old truth. I hear Jeremiah in Jeremiah 6. 16, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the way and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. But here, here is the danger from within. Listen as we go on in that same uh, passage. But they said, we will not walk therein. You got folks, they're always fighting against the truth. Peter says in verse number 13, he says, I consider it right as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling to stir up you by way of, remember, of reminder. In other words, he's going to teach the old truth as long as he is in his physical body. And he knows that he is going to depart this physical body soon. So in verse number 15, he says, I want to be diligent in reminding you so that when I'm gone, you'll remember. You can, you, you can call all these things to mind. That's what Peter says. I'm leaving this life. I'm going to leave you behind. I want you to remember what I told you. We must be committed to the word which is able to build us up and to give us an inheritance. He tells them you see, I didn't get this through cunning and devise fables. This isn't something that I, I made up. I was there with Jesus Christ. I was there on the Mount of Transfiguration with him. I was there when he asked the question, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? He said, I was there to give an answer to the hope that was in me when I answered and said, Thou art the 
the living God. I was there when he said, Thou art Peter. Flesh and blood have not revealed this unto ye. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But my Father, which is in heaven, I was there when he said, Upon the rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I was there when he said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You see, as these apostles left this life, they realized it was of uttermost importance that God's people be firmly planted and anchored and anchored in God's word. Amen. So you won't be able to check with Peter personally, but we are able to turn to the unchanging truth of God's word. You won't, you won't be able to check with Paul personally, but we are, we, we are able to turn to the infallible truths of God's word. When, when danger comes from or without, we are able to turn to the powerful truth of God's word. When dangers come from within, we are able to uh, turn to the double-edged sword of God's word. The word of God is an anchor for our lives. Through the word, we know that Jesus died for our sins. Through the word, we know that Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. Through the word, we know that Jesus rose again with all power in his hand. And if you are not a Christian and you want to be a child of God, you need to be born again. That same Peter that wrote 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. That same Peter that wrote 2 Peter chapter 1 is the same Peter that tells us in Acts chapter 2 verse 38. He says, repent and be baptized every, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And then and only then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you are not a member of the church, you've heard the word. We ask that you believe it with all your heart. Repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Jesus said, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Be willing to confess his name. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father, which is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you before my father, which is in heaven. And be willing to go down in the watery grave of baptism. For what? To wash your sins away. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. For what? That the Lord may add you to the church of Christ. For what? That you may be born again and walk in the newness of life. Is there anybody here? Anybody here? You need to be able to ward off the wiles of the devil. But you got to be in the place. You got to be in the place. Uh, uh, the, 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 the military says be all that you can be. That sounds all right. But I said you got to be in the place where they are being saved. Amen. 
That's the church. Amen. And if you remember the church, you've fallen astray. Repent of your sins and, and, and come back to the Lord. Study the word that you will be built up. And, and study it so that you will grow. He says, add these things, not subtract them. Amen. You need to continue to add to your faith. Amen. Is anyone of any category? We're going to stand and sing the song of invitation. Won't you come?